Welcome to worship with the Congregation of Eastridge Presbyterian Church in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, last week, Pastor Melody welcomed you all with um, a happy new year. And boy, does this week already feel old after only a couple days in the new year. Um, it's kind of like glad 2020 is over and 2021 says, hold my beer. Um, so I'm I'm glad that I'm not alone here this morning, even though you notice um, Pastor Melody is not here with me this morning. Pastor Melody has a week of well-deserved rest this week, but I am instead have uh, my good friend from seminary, um, and my colleague in ministry, uh, the Reverend Carla Maurer. Good morning, Carla. It's good to have you with us. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. You're right. Yeah, you need to do the uh, the time switch because Carla, you're joining us from London. London, in the UK. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Europe. <laughs> Europe. So that is six hours, right? Uh, yes, I think. Yeah. Uh -huh. You're somewhere at four o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. We're so glad you're joining us this morning, Carla. Um. Our big focus in January is to have um, friends and guests join us uh, for our worship here, um, mostly for the after chat. Uh, we said we would uh, invite people who are interesting, and and I thought, well, that makes I need to have my 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 friend Carla, who is the Swiss vicar, join us, and then something even better happened. Carla agreed to preach this morning, so um, and stay for the chat afterwards. So I'm I'm super grateful for that. And with that, I also want to extend uh, a very special welcome to the congregation from the Swiss Church in London, uh, who are joining us for worship this evening. Uh, we are so glad that you are with us here. So if you're joining us, uh, I invite you to say a, a hello in the chat function. And um, this chat function, we also like to monitor throughout the service and uh, say um, uh, if you have comments in the sermon or um, Anything you would like us to talk about in the end, please, please use that function for that. Also, uh, if you share the stream on Facebook, that will give more of your friends an opportunity to join in here as well. Um, the worship materials were mailed out for to the members of the congregation. Uh, they can also be found on our website, eastridge.org, or uh, through one of the links that you find in um, the YouTube and Facebook chat below. I have um, three announcements I'd like to make before we uh, begin our time for worship here for one. This morning, January 10th, is in the church here, the Sunday of the baptism of our Lord. And traditionally at East Rich Presbyterian Church, this is the Sunday where we ordain and install our new elders and deacons. Um, that won't be happening live this morning. That has happened already throughout this week, and we will have a a video uh, to give you a little glimpse of that following the sermon. However, the video was a little bit, didn't turn out the way we hoped. So we don't have each and every face on the screen, but we'll, we'll celebrate um, the ordination installation. Nonetheless, we have um, ordained um, as new deacons, Wahadi Allen and Bill Short and Hope Shortridge. And there's a new elder, Elizabeth Kohal. And we install um, to renewed service, people who have been um, deacons and elders before. This is Mary Amon, Donna Geese, Jim Geese, Judith Keller, Becky Shoup, Kathy Chapman as deacons, and Kurt Beck, Doug McDaniel, and Bill Werbein as ruling elders. That's the first announcement. The second announcement um, is something you find in your lamps as well. Um, you may have seen that right on the uh, front of our weekly newsletter. Um, the Outreach Committee and our Anti-Racism Task Force uh, will like to share with our community a message of hope and compassion and our willingness to help. And in that regard, they created a sign, a sign for um, uh, to be displayed on our church property, but also for you all to, um, to, to take home a copy if you'd like to. And I want to show this to you. We have a sample here. And I think it looks oh, this this way. <laughs> it looks it looks really cool. Um, uh, it's 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 a it says hope, love, equality, inclusion, kindness, and reads peace, and has a uh, an Eastwich logo here as well. If you'd like a copy of that, 
to stake in your yard, uh, please let the office know and uh, you can come pick up. There's on a first come, first serve basis. Uh, or we even deliver if you uh, like us to deliver um, one of those. And if we run out, we're going to print more. So please um, spread um, a message of hope and inclusion here in our community. And finally, um, as every week, I um, remind you to keep our members and friends uh, listed in our prayer list, in your prayers. Uh, and I would like to particularly highlight uh, that you please be in prayer for the family of uh, Wanda Gardner. Uh, it is in the short and certain hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we announced the passing of Wanda Gardner. Uh, she passed uh, yesterday and her services are pending. Please be in um, prayers for the Gardner and Haynes family. With that, let us now do what we came to do this morning. Let us turn our hearts and minds toward God uh, and worship. In our journeying, do we give up resigning our discipleship into a resignation of worshiping the old? God calls again, again, again. Come with me. Give up your blindness. Look and see and find a new vision. Follow me. Follow me home. Let us worship God. of our God and King Lift up your voice and with us sing Oh, praise Him Alleluia Thou burning sun with golden beam Thou silver moon with softer
Please join me in prayer. God of old and new, of young and aged, of tradition and contemporary, we gather to praise you with the whole creation. As we gather this morning for this time to worship, may we create space to allow for your spirit to lead us. As we gather with our own stories and histories, may we leave ourselves open to the breath of change. But we know that change is not always easy. We remember how we used to worry that our traditions might turn a visitor away when we were sitting in seats we always sat in or when we glared at a child that walked in the sanctuary when we were afraid we could make someone uncomfortable. And yet right now in this season when everything is different, we are deeply aware how we all are missing the church we have known. The faces, the worshipers in the pew in front of us, the smell of coffee in the welcome center. We confess that we long for the church of yesterday, of yesteryear. And yet you don't leave us alone in the changes that are going on in us, around us. But rather you invite us to see your face in them. And God, so we pray for all who seek your healing presence at this time. We pray for all who are trying to make sense of their call. We pray for all who strive to make a difference in our world. God of renewal, may we be your wineskins. May we have room to change and to grow as we seek to further the work of your kingdom. Bless this time and the work we do in your service today, tomorrow, in all ways. Amen. Friends, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. That God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. God does not deal with us according to our sin or repay us according to our iniquity. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our sin from us. Friends, receive the good news and be at peace. Let us share a sign of Christ's peace with one another in the chat, through a message, or with those in your room where you worship this morning. Good morning. It has been a few weeks since I have been with you, and I am so glad to be back this morning. I hope you had a great Christmas and winter break. So, yes, I am on the roof this morning. But before I tell you why, I want to back up a little with our Bible story, because last week's story helps us with the first part of our Bible story today. Last week, we heard three healing stories. We heard about a man who really had trouble with some of his thoughts and some of his feelings and some of his behaviors. He came to Jesus and Jesus noticed this was happening. So he helped the man to feel better. Then we hear about Jesus going to visit Simon and Andrew. And when he arrives, Simon's mother-in-law is really sick with a fever. Jesus sees that she doesn't feel so well, and he sits with her and heals her. Lastly, a man who had a skin disease. He knows that Jesus can heal him, so he goes to find him. He finds Jesus, and Jesus heals him. But this time, Jesus says, You go and tell the priests that you are healed, but don't tell anyone else. Well, guess what? He told as many people as he could find. So pretty soon, people were looking all 
over the place to find this Jesus that could heal people. This gets us to our story today. So now that people know about Jesus and his healing power, he is surrounded by so many people. Enough people that you can't get to him. Today, Jesus is at a house in Capernaum, and lots of people are around it and in it. So many people that you can't get through the door. Now, four men came along and tried to get in because they had brought their friend who couldn't walk. They wanted him healed, but they couldn't get through the door. So they decided to climb up on the roof and lower the man down through a hole. And when they did this, the paralyzed friend was right in front of Jesus. And guess what Jesus did? He healed the paralyzed man. The man was able to get up off of his mat, walk, and go home. Now that's a lot of healing stories. These stories help us a lot when we are learning about all the power that God gave to Jesus and how Jesus can help us. But how do we take this story and share it with those around us? I don't think we have to get up on the roof, but I think we might be able to do it like this. We will never have the healing power of Jesus. God doesn't give that kind of healing power to just anyone. But God does give all of us different types of gifts and skills to help people heal. Because God cares about us so much, God doesn't want us to be in pain. We have nurses, doctors, physical therapists, and pharmacists that help us to feel better when we are in physical pain. We have counselors and parents and foster parents and family and friends, siblings, teachers, coaches, and other caring adults that can help us when we need help with our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And we have youth pastors and pastors and chaplains and all kinds of church members to help us when we're having trouble understanding God. All of us fit into one of these categories, which means we are all able to help others with healing when they need it. And whenever we are hurting, all those people are there to help us too. And sometimes it can take a group of folks from that list that I just mentioned. We should never be afraid to ask for as much help as we need when we're helping others or asking for help ourselves. So as we think about these healing stories today, I want to leave you with an assignment. I want you to hold up your hand and spread out your fingers and count how many fingers you have on your hand. Then I want you to think of that many names of that many people who you could go to when you need help and healing for you and for others. Would you please pray with me? Dear God, through Jesus, you healed the sick. Help us to know when we or others need healing. Give us the words to say and the things we can do to help them. Amen. Miss Chris climbed on the roof. I don't think we can top that. That's a challenge, Chris. At um, this point, we come to the offering in our service, and the offering is the time when we gather our gift and we are grateful for any and all of you who continue to support us with your gifts and times and talents but i do want to take a moment this morning and and take time during the next song the offertory to um take this time as an invitation to ref reflect on the question that chris asked where where do 
where do you need healing and where can you be of healing to someone else? Please pray with me. Holy God, may all that we offer to you this day of ourselves and of our worldly goods be used for your purpose. And may we each play our part in providing for those in need of healing, of guidance, or renewal. So be it. Amen.
Our scripture this morning continues um, from the Gospel of Mark. We are reading through the Gospel of Mark this year, uh, following the narrative lectionary. And the scripture this morning is from Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 22. Before I tend to scripture, um, let us pray. Speak to us now, living God, as you have spoken to our ancestors, to the voices of the prophets, the breath of your spirit and the life of your son so that we may live according to your word, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Listen now to the word of God. After a few days, Jesus went back to Capernaum, and people heard that he was at home. So many gathered that, they, that there was no longer space, not even near the door. Jesus was speaking the word to them. Some people arrived, and four of them were bringing to him a man who was paralyzed. They couldn't carry him through the roof. So through, they couldn't carry him through the crowd. So they tore off part of the roof above where Jesus was. When they had made an opening, they lowered the mat on which the paralyzed man was lying. When Jesus saw their face, saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, "Child, your sins are forgiven." Some legal experts were sitting there, muttering among themselves, why does he speak this way? He's insulting God. Only the one God can forgive sins. Jesus immediately recognized what they were discussing. And he said to them, why do you fill your minds with these questions? Which is easier to say to a paralyzed person, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take up your bed and walk? But so you will know that the human one has authority on the earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, get up, take your mat, and go home. Jesus raised him up, and right away he picked up his mat and walked out in front of everybody. They were all amazed and praised God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. Jesus went out beside the lake again. The whole crowd came to him and he began to teach them. As he continued along, he saw Levi, Alpaeus' son, sitting at the kiosk for collecting taxes. Jesus said to him, follow me. Levi got up and followed him. Jesus sat down to eat at Levi's house. Many tax collectors and sinners were eating with Jesus and his disciples. Indeed, many of them had become his followers. When some of the legal experts from among the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why is he eating with sinners and tax collectors? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, healthy people don't need a doctor, but sick people do. I didn't come to call righteous people, but sinners. John's disciples and the Pharisees had a habit of fasting. Some people asked Jesus, why do John's disciples and the Pharisees' disciple fast, but yours don't? Jesus said, The wedding guests can't fast while the groom is with them, can they? As long as they have the groom with them, they can't fast. But the days will come when the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one sews a piece of new unshrunk clo cloth on old clothes, otherwise the patch tears away from it the new from the old, and makes a worse tear. No one pours new wine into old leather wineskins. Otherwise, the wine would burst the wineskins, and the wine would be lost, and the wineskins destroyed. But new wine is for new wineskins. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good afternoon, everyone, or uh, good morning. <laughs> we have uh, different time zones, I think, maybe getting hungry for lunch or for dinner, depending on where we are. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here with you today. And I would not have thought in a million years that Thomas's congregation, um, your congregation in Eastridge in Lincoln and our London congregation would ever worship together. But then who would have thought that our church gatherings would suddenly go online with hardly a few weeks to figure out how to do that? 
So here we are, Lincoln and London, united in the name of God, our parents, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And I think it's just really amazing to be together in that way. And after the devastating news that have reached us, of course, like everywhere around the globe, from Washington, from Capitol Hill, from the riots on Capitol Hill, I hope that this small act of unification that we are celebrating today can at least help a little bit to heal and to counteract separation and hatred. So you are very much in our thoughts and prayers in this situation. The link between our two congregations leads us to Bern, the capital of Switzerland, although very strictly speaking, Switzerland doesn't have a capital, but that's a different matter. Look it up online if you're interested in these uh, kind of political details, it's quite interesting. But anyway, we call it capital for now, and that's Bern, and that's where Thomas and I studied reform theology together. And um, Thomas made it all across the Atlantic Ocean. I made it only just across the channel. We both speak Swinglish with American or British accent or Swinglish or the other way around. Anyway, we do understand each other, I think. We haven't really spoken in a few years properly, Thomas and I, until recently, but we had a few Facebook messages here and there. That was kind of the contact we had. But it's just really good to know, I think, for both of us, to know that there is a minister from Switzerland somewhere out there in the world sharing memories and also having some sort of similar experiences. So it's just good, Thomas, to be in touch again, actually, through this online service. It's, it's amazing. So thank you so much, brothers and sisters in Christ, to inviting us, our congregation from London today, to this service and worshipping with you. It means a lot to us to get at least virtually out of our living rooms because we find ourselves in the third nationwide lockdown and we are pretty much stuck at home. So this is really a moment to get out. And on top of that, also connection with the world in the face of Brexit, that will be, I think, quite a bumpy ride for us in the, in the years to come. And we need to feel that connection with the world. And then there is also another connection between our congregation or maybe between our countries. It's a bit more far-fetched than the first one. And those who know me know that there is never a sermon without a bit of a history lesson because I'm a, I'm a history enthusiast. I just love everything history. So pandemic and presidential elections and Brexit aside, 2020 marked... Um, an important event. It marked 400 years since a boat called the Mayflower set sail in Plymouth and crossed the Atlantic Ocean. And on board of that boat, a group of pilgrims, men and women, they were deeply religious people. And this undiscovered new world was their Jerusalem. Their journey had previously taken them to the Netherlands, where they were seeking religious freedom, because the pilgrims, they were critiques of the Mother Church. They were separatists from the Church of England. But then the war started, which we now know as the Thirty Year War on the continent, and the pilgrims were pushed back to England and then onwards to America. That journey if you look at it, looking back now, was a, an act of madness. They set sail in winter and they arrived on the East Coast in the middle of winter. They were really not equipped for that adventure. And there isn't really any register of the Mayflower and the people on it leaving because they weren't important enough. They were just a group of mad people. So what we know about the pilgrims, about these early settlers, we know from William Bradford, who was their leader. And I would like to read you some lines from his pilgrim diary. The pilgrim diary is really the source of knowledge that we have um, to know what these people went through. These are words from a pilgrim, four pilgrims, and I hope you can all somehow relate to them. So William Bradford wrote, 
From my years young in days of youth, God did make known to me his truth and called me from my native place for to enjoy the means of grace. In wilderness he did me guide and in strange lands for me provide. In fears and wants, through weal and woe, a pilgrim passed I to and fro. I actually visited Plymouth Plantation as a teenager with my parents, and um, it's a very good memory. I, I was already a history enthusiast as a teenager, which is a bit weird, I know, but there we go. So today, luckily, crossing the Atlantic Ocean is not like nowhere near as dangerous and time consuming as back then. But weirdly, the pandemic has put an, an hold on, on the going forth and back between the continents. And especially Thomas, I know, can feel that very much in current times. It's um, not easy if you have family on a different continent or in a different country to have that restrictions on travel. But perhaps it brings us a little bit closer to the early settlers, that uh, restriction that we have. And thank God, compared to 400 years ago, we have the Internet to keep us connected. OK, now that was my history lesson. We move on. <laughs> 400 years later, to arrive today, both our countries, the UK and the United States, are in turmoil. On your side of the ocean, the presidential elections, the riots on Capitol Hill, and we are facing Brexit. We find ourselves in a national lockdown on this side of the ocean. And then, of course, the pandemic that concerns all of us. It's hard to keep up with the news and to absorb all that is going on. And then, let alone all the tragedies, all the people around the globe that no longer make the headlines of the news, all those who have been forgotten, all those who have become invisible. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, Jesus talks about sin and forgiveness, the very heart of Christian theology. Yet forgiveness is a double-edged sword, or at least a complex matter. On the one hand, we know that forgiveness is key to inner peace. It is key to inner freedom. And yet, at the same time, there isn't a forgiveness switch that we can just turn on. Forgiveness has to come from within. And sometimes it just doesn't happen. As the world is getting more and more polarized, extreme opinions and hateful feelings spreading like bushfire, forgiveness becomes an ever more precious good that we must protect at all price. And funnily enough, like an hour ago, I made myself a cup of tea. That's what we drink in England. And I like to, um, this is my mug. I like to uh, drink Yogi tea. I don't know if you know that brand in, in the United States. And that little label, they it's always a little kind of... Um, you know, a sentence on the back, like a thought on the label. I don't know if you can see it here. Hmm? Maybe not. Well, it says, forgiveness is an act of consciousness. I mean, like I, I, I had the tea like an hour ago, I made it. So it was, it was about forgiveness as an act of consciousness. And I think it's very much true. It is like sometimes a conscious decision to go that path of forgiveness, even, even though it might be a really hard thing to do or a hard way to go. So Jesus, whenever Jesus went, wherever he went, he sat with people who were either labeled sinners for who they were or what they did, or who were indeed particularly unpleasant people and really weren't very good people. And he forgave. He just went around forgiving people their sins. And that was much to the dislike of the religious authorities. 
They accused him of blasphemy. Where do you take your authority from? They asked him. And who do you think you are going around forgiving sins? Jesus, it seems, was never short of an answer. And I really admire that about him. You know that moment you, when you are challenged and um, you want to say something, but it just doesn't come out. And then you walk away and you come up with the best answer ever, but it's too late. That doesn't seem to happen to Jesus. He always has a witty or thought-provoking answer. And so has he in this time in this situation with forgiving the sinners. So, for instance, when the religious authorities challenge him about forgiving a sinner, and in this case, it's a paralyzed man, a man who cannot walk, he says, what is easier, to forgive sins or to say to a paralyzed person, stand up, take your mat and go home? Now, most of us would probably say that the miracle healing is the more difficult thing to do. But is it really? I think that's something to think about. To make a point and to prove that he has his power from God, Jesus heals the paralyzed man. He does say to him, stand up and go home. But it is very clear that the forgiveness of the sin is more important and he thinks harder to do. And then we heard in the reading this other situation, Jesus was challenged for sharing a meal with the tax collectors and with other people considered sinners. Tax collectors were considered sinners because very often they enriched themselves unlawfully. So they weren't very popular with people. Again, Jesus has a good answer ready. He says, those who are well have no need for a doctor, but those who are sick, I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. Jesus makes it clear his authority comes from God. He can heal. He can do miracles. But the greatest miracle is the forgiveness of sins. So God empowers Jesus to forgive sins and Jesus empowers us to forgive the sins. He does that with the commissioning of the disciples in Matthew 28, where he says to his disciples, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them and teach them what I have commanded you. Teach them what I have commanded you. And one of his biggest teaching is the forgiveness of sins. And we have that authority. We have this ability and we have the power in us to do that. A power that comes from God. That's a very important lesson, I think, to remember. Because sometimes we are unable to forgive. Sometimes we can't find it within ourselves. And we hold on to grudges. We are frustrated. We hold on to bad feelings. We can't let them go. And ultimately that holding on harms us more than anything else. Because grudges are like chains. Not being able to forgive keeps us captive, holds us back. So I wonder what is the alternative to forgiveness? If we want to be free, there isn't any. Therefore we need help. Because perhaps forgiveness is indeed more difficult to do than a miracle healing. Forgiveness is in God, is always in God, even if we can't find it within ourselves. Of that we can be sure. And that we must remember.
takes our grudges, our bad feelings and frustrations onto the cross. Jesus liberates us. In him is forgiveness for all sins, for all sinners. And that also includes our incapability to forgive, which is human. I have now spoken about forgiving others, but then there is another aspect that I think is really important, especially these days. And it has become crucial to me, and perhaps you can relate to that too. What about forgiving ourselves? And I'm not talking necessarily about wrongdoings that we immediately know we have messed up somehow. I'm talking about the many times that we unnecessarily put pressure on ourselves, that we judge ourselves, we expect too much of ourselves, we exhaust ourselves and we become frustrated with our loved ones. We must learn to be gentle on ourselves, to be forgiving, especially in confusing times like these, when the world seems out of control and we can't keep up. We can't change the whole world at once, but we can make a small impact where we live. We can make an impact by being gentle with ourselves, first of all. Because only then can we be gentle with other people. And I remember another minister friend of mine in Switzerland once said, you don't have to save the world. Jesus Christ has already done that. And it's a sentence I remind myself of almost every day. So be gentle on yourself. Nurture yourself before you act in the world. There will always be work to be done in God's kingdom and Jesus needs disciples who know how to nurture themselves because that makes us more patient, more forgiving and more respectful of others. May God grant us peace and patience, especially patience with ourselves and liberate us from our chains. Amen. Friends, there are varieties of gifts, but it is the same Spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who is served. To each is given a gift of the Spirit to be used for the common good. Together, we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Kurt, Doug, Bill, Elizabeth, Wahadi, Mary, Donna, Jim, Judith, Becky, Kathy, Bill, and Hope. In baptism, you were claimed by the love of God, clothed in the grace of Jesus Christ, and anointed with the gifts of the Holy Spirit to share Christ's mission in the world. Now you are called by God through the voice of the church for new service and ministry in Jesus' name. Do you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior? Acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If so, please say, I do. I do. I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? If so, say, I do. I do. I do. I do. Will you be governed by our church's polity? And will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? If so, say, I will. I will. I will. Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? If so, please say, I will. I will. I will. I will. Wahadi, Mary, Donna, Jim, Judith, Becky, Kathy, Bill, and Hope, will you be a faithful deacon teaching charity, 
urging concern and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need. And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, I will. I will. I will. Kurt, Elizabeth, Doug, and Bill, will you be a faithful ruling elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in the councils of the church? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, I will. I will. I will. Do we, the members of the church, accept Kurt, Doug, Bill, Elizabeth, Wahadi, Mary, Donna, Jim, Judith, Becky, Kathy, Bill, and Hope? as ruling elders and deacons chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. We do. Do we agree to pray for them, to encourage them, to respect their decisions, and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? We do. Gracious and eternal God, with joy we give you thanks and praise. Throughout the ages and in every place, you have chosen servants from among your people to point the way to salvation by your grace. We praise you for Jesus Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life to set others free. Appointed by your Holy Spirit, he proclaimed your reign on earth, revealing your saving love in all he said and did. And sustain your church in ministry ground us in the gospel, secure our hope in Christ, strengthen our service to the outcast, and increase our love for one another. Show us the transforming power of your grace in our life together, that we may be effective servants of the gospel, offering a compelling witness in the world to the good news of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. And so now you all have been installed as deacons and ruling elders into active service. You are ordained to ministries of servants and governance in the Church of Jesus Christ and for the congregation at Eastridge Presbyterian Church. I charge you to be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole life will bear witness to the crucified and risen Christ. We would shake and hug and do all those things. And... <laughs> People will clap and... <laughs> So 
calling, calling us to the cross. You're calling, calling, calling us to the cross. You're calling, you're calling, you're calling us to the cross. You're calling. Again, dear friends, I would invite you to stay with us um, for a time of conversation with the Reverend Carla Maurer um, right immediately following this benediction. Uh, please be with us with your questions and topics you're interested in. Uh, please let us know. Uh, we can chat a little bit more. In the meantime, um, go with this benediction. Send us out, God into the world, your world, go with us. And may your Holy Spirit guide us in your ways through your Son. Teach us to embrace the changes that our God wills for the creation. Amen. And we're both on. Carla. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your timely and, and much needed message this morning. And just overall for for being with us today. Well, thank you so much for having me and for having the congregation. Well, I, I would like to see you in person, Thomas. It's been like such a long time, but this is better than nothing. It's better than nothing. And it's kind of like, um, yeah, it's, it's like half a life ago or at least... A third. I know, yeah. no, I'm not that young anymore. A, a, a <laughs> quarter of life ago or something like that. A <laughs> third. Um, yeah. So um, I, I said in the intro introduction um, that this January and February, until the beginning of Lent, we kind of had our um, our intention to, to invite guests uh, to our services. And uh, Melody uh, said it like this we would like to feature speakers who have fun interesting and sometimes quirky passions and um and i immediately thought of you and even though i thought it was hard to pinpoint what your exact interesting um fun and quirky passion is because gosh i i know you you are uh, a woman of many traits i mean uh, in <laughs> in in the few years that i've known you, you you've worn many hats um you are pastor in london you um worked in ecumenical connections you have uh lived in strasbourg and worked with um european institutions you um in a previous life uh, you were a singer in a band uh, a recording artist i saw you sing in the beard um and um I know you were heavily involved in politics. You were the youth rep in one of the top levels of one of the big Swiss parties. Uh, oh, I forgot about that. That's you scary. you uh, wanted to become an actor. Um, you have you, you said uh, in one of your um, podcasts you say you had a love affair with uh, musical theater. You are big into arts, and now you do this podcast. So, I guess my question for you is: Which of all these fun and interesting and quirky passion 
do you get to continue to live on in your present life? That's a really good question. Um, I guess um, in some ways, all of them, and that's probably because I, I uh, more or less accidentally ended up what I think is the most beautiful profession or mm. calling in the world, and that's being a minister and serving a congregation, which I never in a million years would have expected to do in my life. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I did like, I, I wanted to become an actor. I was a sing singer in a band and I did all these things. But in a way, you know, they're all very useful skills to have. Um, singing, I mean, now I kind of sing in Sunday services and in the shower. Um, and yeah, but it's kind of, a, you know, it's, it's good to have an ear for music and, and to have that. And then, I mean, to be honest, acting is a very good skill as a minister. And we mm. are even part of our minister training now, uh, nowadays is um, with actors. They teach us how to, yeah, how to how to to make a, a presence and how to 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 speak well and 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 all that. So I think in a way it all comes together. I don't feel like I, I've left anything behind. Hmm. Yeah, but I wouldn't want to change being a minister for anything else in the world. I, I really I, I don't feel I have any regrets in that um, respect. You, you you call it uh, one of the most beautiful professions and um you would you say it's also kind of like um because a lot of it comes together of of that yeah because for me like being a minister and not not being a minister being a christian i think um is is a, is a calling for life and being a minister doesn't is not a nine to five job it doesn't begin at a certain time and then ends at a certain time it's it's really all-encompassing which has also his, its risks so i think as ministers it's very important we know our own boundaries and then we know also when to switch off and also do that it's i, I think that's so crucial but then it's really um something it's it's like uh, it, it's a calling that it's it, it's a calling that you have throughout life and if you tell people you're a minister of religion even like you know when you're out or when you meet people in a different context you're suddenly you, you, people might suddenly open up and mm. then you are in that minister role so you can't choose when you are minister you always are a minister and uh yeah i think i think it's 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 really good to have that to to to, to have i mean it's a big responsibility as well so maybe that's the quirkiest of all in my life you know from like when how i grew up becoming an actor or something like that would have been a bit more um unsurprising but i think the fact that i became a minister i think that's f f with my biography is more quirky than anything else <laughs> <laughs> um it, it is a bit um at the same time as the, the presbyterians would say predestined right that way <laughs> um you you bring in a biography um of of different kind of um what should I say, traditions um, through your parents, through your grandparents. Um, um, and I know for you, uh, history is a very important topic for you. Uh, you mentioned that this morning um, and even took us on the May Mayflower. Um, I, I think my, my question is, uh, to what extent do you think has history that you, you were born in shaped you in the way you do ministry today you mean like my history the your, like, your biography and and yeah. your even your generations that you come from generation and context and family mm -hmm. and all mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. um oh, i think it's a really big part of us mm -hmm. um how we grew up and where we grew up and who we grew up with i think that really shapes us and I mean, obviously, family, I think that the first kind of foundation of trust in the world and in people is very much set in the family and in the immediate circle around the family. Um, but then also like the friends we meet and the yeah the political situation, the, the whole society we grew up, I think it, it, it's, um, it's a big part of us. But what I think is really important it doesn't mean that we have to be def defined by it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is a big part, but there are also things that we can let go and just say, okay, yes, that's a part of me. And 
um, but I don't have to maybe some things that we find difficult that um, as I said this morning it's about forgive uh, like earlier on it's about um, letting things go about forgiving um, be forgiving and say okay I can let this go I think when we when we grow older um, or like as, as we become um, adults it's very much our decision what we take with us and where we let go so we can't just blame it on like say oh i'm like this or i'm like that because that's how i grew up no we we are um yeah we have this uh, we have a responsibility to shape our own lives mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's certainly that that resonates a lot um on some time it's it's kind of like the it makes up the paint that you're painting your life with, but you still need to paint it on your own. Um, oh, that's a very good image, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think decisions like, I mean, we share this decision of, we, we took um, we took the decision to, to move abroad, to emigrate. <laughs> and when you do that at the beginning, you think, oh, it's great, it's an adventure. <laughs> you know, you followed the love of your life. So in our case, we both followed our loves, our the loves of our lives. Um, my husband is British and you, you married with an, um, an American and we, we have families now. Um, and at the beginning, you just think, oh, it's a great adventure. Let's just go. And you have no idea what the long term <laughs> effect of this will be. You have no idea how it will shape your life. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you look back and it's like, hang on a minute. Is this my life now? Did mm. I do this? Mm -hmm. And then you have the, the all the good sides that come with emigrating, and you also have all the regrets. But it's your life, and mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. that's what you what you are, who you are. I, I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah, so so you you use that word, and it's probably more uh, common in English uh, than it uh, British English than it's in American English. The word vicar. Uh, and, and of course, when I hear the word, I, I think of the vicar of Dibley, um, <laughs> uh, which is. Uh, Don French in that wonderful role, um, uh, and, but you're the vicar in a, a very specific setting in that that uh, thing called the Swiss Church, and we're excited to have members uh, of your church join us today. What can you tell us about this congregation, and and what what exactly is a Swiss Church, and how is that even a thing? <laughs> I know we represent the Swiss church in the UK. I mean, right, I don't know right. if we do. I, it's the only one. It's the only Swiss church in the UK on only one of three Swiss reformed churches abroad. So it's a very kind of, it, it, like a, many other churches, like for instance, the German Lutheran churches, they have churches all over the world or the Anglican church. You find them all over the world, but it's quite unique for our small reformed like Protestant church. Um, it's a uh, congregation. It actually brings us back somehow a little bit to the Mayflower because there is also a Dutch church in London and the Dutch church was founded in 1550 and was the very first church. Um, they called them stranger churches at the time that stranger was allowed to, to settle in London uh -huh. or to open their own uh -huh. branch in London. So the Dutch church got this um, decree from the Queen to say, uh, I think it was... Uh, Queen at the time, yeah. Anyway, um, from the monarch <laughs> to settle, and that that paved the way for other churches to open their branches in in London. And you have like nowadays you have a French Protestant church, German church, Finnish church, American church. We actually work quite closely with the American church in London. I see. Um, yeah, they're not far from us. We're in the same. We meet uh, monthly for for breakfast, and the American church team is also part of that. Um, so we are part of the tradition of uh, stranger churches in, in, in London, and um, it was founded in 1762. And we still, our members are still mainly uh, Swiss people or people who have uh, in their hi family history um, um, a history of migration from Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's, that's our congregation. And what is interesting about what I really wasn't used to at the beginning when I first arrived we are not a local church because Swiss people live across London. So we mainly have London Swiss who come to church. They live across London and they sometimes travel up to an hour to come to church. Hmm. And that's a very different way of working from 
having a local church where you meet other church members in the supermarket, you meet them on your walk, um, you know, they're just kind of, they're your neighbors, they're next door. That's not the case with the Swiss church. So it's a different kind of connection that we have. So what I'm hearing is that uh, a big part of um, what it means to be the Swiss church is your shared tradition, your shared heritage. Um, that's part of your identity, um, which which brings me another topic. And I know we, we talked about that earlier when we when we talked earlier this week about that. Um, at least for me, it was in a way I became more Swiss um, by moving abroad. Uh, there's this kind of like for some reason that became a big part of how. I identify who who I am as is the Swiss, and and it helps that there are not that many Swiss here in Lincoln. That so I can say I'm the Swiss from Lincoln. I know there's another one so that <laughs> uh, who is French speaking and owns a uh, watch shop. Uh, but um, so I, I think for for me moving abroad, that Swissness became um, uh, I think a, a, a more defining mark from my, myself w would you say the same thing for you or something similar i think it's a mix of both i think living in the uk i feel i became somehow more swiss or i kind of i can send feel my own swissness much more and also things that i find a bit irritating about the culture here or how things work here but as more as i assimilate as well i at the same time, there are just things about Switzerland that I find really odd now, or I just find irritating as well. So it's, I think it's on both sides, but definitely the awareness of my heritage has become much stronger. And I think also for our congregation, um, in some ways we are, um, in some ways we are really very Swiss. That what brings us together. So it, it's, uh, it's our. Um, cultural heritage as much as our um, wish to worship in the Reformed tradition. And it also makes that we have a very a variety of different um, um, of, of, of different uh, spiritualities within the Protestant traditions, um, from evangelical to more high church. Mm. From We have Catholics, Anglican and Reformed people worshipping together. So it's really a mix of people in terms of the... Um, denominations wow wow but yeah, we that... are all there is the connection to switzerland that ultimately i think brings us all together yeah what, what would you say i mean this is amazing uh, i mean kind of like this the swissness is common denominator and and kind of um because in bringing faith traditions together that you think they don't go together but that that common root that shared root is kind of like enough a bond um yeah what, it what... really helps to overcome boundaries between the religious denominations because what that brings us together the swissness mm. it's funny maybe maybe we just should do ecumenical life a bit more by nationality and then <laughs> that might help to bring the to, to overcome those bridges uh, the gaps between denominations who knows <laughs> <laughs> Can also get you in quite messy waters uh, with. I know. Uh, yeah. No, don't do it. It's a really bad idea. I'm just saying. Nationalist <laughs> like, Christian, national no. Christianity. Uh, but but uh, kind of along those lines, what, what would be something you would say this is typical as Swiss? Swiss people are very loud. <laughs> La Compared I mean... to British people, anyway. <laughs> I don't know. You have to you have to make the comparison with American people, but I find it really loud. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I've heard it said that Americans are very loud. Uh, in our family, I'm definitely the louder person than my American wife. So maybe it is true that the Swiss are very loud. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's just when you go like when I now when I'm in a in a bus. Well, sometimes also my. Um, my husband because he doesn't understand Swiss German and when I'm on my phone with my Swiss relatives he says why oh, have you been in in an argument have you been fighting with us no just talking because when I speak Swiss German I go into louder mode and when I speak English I go into quiet mode mm. that's funny that is fun Swiss um 
Well, obviously the Kantönli Geist. That's uh, you need to explain that. Okay, the Kantönli Geist. It's uh, probably actually it's quite similar to um, the states, isn't it? Like the fe uh, uh, federalistic political system that each canton, which is like a state, has a lot of power, um, so a lot of decision making power in certain areas, and the the, the government can't just decide for for like for instance, I mean. A very good example now in the pandemic in Switzerland, the government has a very hard time to to make any um, guidelines for the whole of Switzerland because the cantons might disagree and then they can't implement those um, guidelines. <laughs> um, so and, and that makes this I mean, it's very very democratic, basic like this direct democracy. And in a, in a time like this where you need really fast like swift decision making. Mm -hmm. that uh, but i think you you share that a bit more in the states maybe obviously here the government is just like okay this is what we do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah is it you think in in london in the uk uh more like what's like like in france like centralized it's paris quite, yeah. decides okay yeah it's quite centralized i think when it comes maybe to the major city i think maybe the like london has its own voice mm -hmm. And that there can be a bit of, um, um, yeah. But but other than that, it's really very central. some pushback from Scotland or something like that. Oh yeah, of course. And then yeah, the, <laughs> the other part of the UK, of course. Yeah, by the end of the day. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And oh, you know what else is very Swiss? Um, but that's something I find a bit difficult. I don't know if I should say that. Okay. Um, you know, I, I kind of really, obviously, I, I, there's a lot of things I love about Switzerland, but there's one thing. I Switzerland, we love you, everyone who's you. watching. You're wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, here goes. <laughs> okay, well, good. No, what I find sometimes a bit difficult now is that um, Swiss, Swiss, Switzerland or Swiss people, I don't know, or Switzerland as a whole, like think they're not affected by things or like some somehow things will always be sorted out for them. You know, and I find, for instance, now with the pandemic, it's like, I mean, the way it's it's done in, in Switzerland compared to other European countries is like, no, you you are you are in this pandemic as well. Yes, mm -hmm. you can open the ski resorts. Yes, you can open your restaurants, even though the government told you not to open the restaurants. But, you know, you're part of this as well. And the government can't save can't save you in in any case it's like sometimes it affects you and sometimes you're in it as well and i find that a bit weird so i'm I, yeah that's something that i don't always quite understand nowadays about swiss people to to feel it will always be sorted out for them mm -hmm. i don't know if you share that if, if you get that feeling as well well yes and, and i think it's sometimes it's it's also personality traits that i relate to very well i mean that the whole idea of neutrality that i can I can just stay out of this, you know. You, you you guys figure this out. You're much bigger, and so on. And um, maybe we can make a profit on the side, um, but we don't need to make the unpopular decisions and so on. I think this is this is definitely something that, and and it won't affect us. That is an interesting to point it out that way. Yeah. But we want to like, and now I feel, of course, bad because we always feel bad to talk about bad about Switzerland. What do you miss most about Switzerland, Thomas? Well, I mean, the obvious is is uh, the obvious is the cheese. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, there's so many things. Um, the people, most most of all, um, the, the people, most of all. Um, but 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 there, there's there's a lot of things that. Um, you don't know how much you miss them until you're not there and and it's it's not immediately accessible um um places that have a special meaning and and um how small everything is and you don't appreciate that in switzerland um and you don't realize how small things are and you think oh we're a big country and mountains and so on mm -hmm. but um there are so many beautiful places that you can go right away um within a, a few hours travel and um it's a beautiful place to be live mm. um but the other thing I'm, I'm really fond of is is really um i mean you you kind of pointed out the federalist spirit which which can be uh, messy but um what i really love about switzerland is this um this this willingness for compromise um to go for a compromise and it makes for incredibly boring politics but 
man, I I miss boring politics right now. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. I I mean, yeah. when 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 you when you can say after hearing a politician speak on TV, if you, the only thing you can say it was a boring speech, isn't that a good news? I mean, <laughs> yeah. um, and, and um, yeah. So so there's there's that part. Yeah, and this thing, there's no, there's not really, there, there aren't really any big surprises as such, and and the things take so so long, and they can be really frustrating and infuriating, but I I agree with you. In the end of the day, um, it's uh, I I prefer that system. I also really like the system that f four parties govern together, mm -hmm. and they have to come. It's it's all co governed with by uh, common sense. Um, I, I really like that. I, I never quite got used to the opposition system, like where two parties just shout at each other and fight for who who is taking the lead. I, mm -hmm. yeah, because I think in the long term, it, yeah, and and now we, I mean we have this example obviously in the UK with uh, with Brexit, who was just done. But I think it will. Be, I personally think it would be hugely damaging to the economy here, and it's just been done by a few. I think it was just the power thing, and and, and um. And it's just not really good for the country. And I don't think something radical like that could happen in Switzerland. And yeah, maybe that's better. But then on the other hand, you have like decisions like the vote for women that was only introduced in 1971. Sure, we don't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Where we you see, I mean, there is definitely slow. also a disadvantage yeah. to our slowness. Right, right, right. Yeah. But, yeah. but we, we can vote still and that's, you know. Yeah. Well, I, I do, I do think there's there's something about that. Um, of course, here's the two two party system, which in the best its best possible form would be a rivalry for the better vision for America. So basically, let's let's compete and um, have a vision that includes the most people in each version of it. And uh, in the worst case, it's a way to to demonize the other. And, um, and 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 I'm just thinking about that. I mean, that this 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 hits with the, with the sermon about that 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 core value of forgiveness, which can also be a cheap excuse to just uh, um, just wash over differences and and evil things and so on. But there's this vision in, in at the heart of her faith is that vision of forgiveness always there, and our human reaction is Jesus. You can't do that. They, those are terrible people over there or whatever and and, and jesus response is i can <laughs> um the, i mean the vision is always bigger than one side winning i think that is um, um yeah i thought you, you that was really something we needed to hear this morning i i just was just looking through the chat and i saw um um, yeah, Chris Bernays is commenting 1971 women's vote, <laughs> question mark, question mark, exclamation mark. Yes, this, it's true. We were that late. Yeah, and maybe I can even add to that, that there is the canton of, so canton is like a, a state, the canton of Appenzell Innerrhoden, which is a very small and very conservative state. And they they were for, forced to introduce women's rights on the canton level in 1991. Mm. They were forced. So basically, yeah, by, so, yeah. federal so law the government was said, pushed okay, on they, the state they, law. No. They had a vote in 1991, again, for women's suffrage, and they turned it down. And then the government said, no, no, no. This time, it doesn't count. You introduce women's vote now. Well, which which, which point know. something like, I mean, the limits of democracy and majority rule in a certain place. Um, mm. Yeah. We don't want it here. Uh, if it goes about the individual right or minority right, then can't have the final word. Um, the other thing is, is a message, a question by John Dooling, who wants to know uh, which historical person and or saint inspires Pastor Carla today? Oh, that's a, that's a very easy one. My uh, the most inspiring saint for me is Teresa of Avila, the Spanish nun um, from the I think 17th century. Sometimes I don't get the uh, centuries right, but I think she's from the 17th century. Um, Teresa of Avila um, is for me one of the most inspiring. She has this really 
fantastic internal life and her I think her her prayer life and how she um she she spoke about those different chambers of spirituality that you can travel through on uh, on a journey with God and I I think she she is uh she's amazing yeah Teresa of Avila Teresa of Avila mm -hmm. that's um that's a good answer too. Yeah. An ecumenical answer. Yeah. Oh, and then maybe a modern modern day. Uh, yeah, exactly. And she also had uh, Jewish roots, by the way, mm. Mm -hmm. mm. which was very difficult at the time. She kind of had to hide that. Um, she so yeah so she uh, yeah so she has a Jewish roots as well. But um, the other person that's the more modern day, so twentieth century. That's the first the. A uh, first woman who was ever um, ordained, no, no, um, who was ever uh, leading a parish in Switzerland was Greti Kaprezofla in Furna. That's a very small mountain village in Switzerland. And she, at the time, women couldn't be ordained, um, but she was ordained anyway. And, but she couldn't be selected to be a minister. She, but then Furna said, well, we don't care. We appoint her anyway. We want her as our minister. So they did that, although it wasn't possible and it wasn't allowed. And for a few years, they, the, the, the people of Furna were able to finance her salary. And then after a few years, they ran out of money. And then the canton basically said, no, the canton actually said, you know what, if you keep, if you, if you keep her as a minister, we have to, um, we, we have to cut you off. Hmm. And then she was basically pushed out of that ministry. So she was the first illegal minister in Switzerland. And she also invented um, uh, trousers for skiing because the girls from the, like the village, the, the girls had only had to wear skirts and skiing was the most practical means of transport. So they skied <laughs> down to the church, but, and then you like the, 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 the snow would, would catch on, on the, I don't know what is it called, you know, like uh, around the skirts. Um, so they were like, the skirts were really heavy with snow. So uh -huh. she invented um, ski trousers for the girls. It's pretty good. That's yeah. This is uh also, this is every possible cliche about Switzerland is in that story. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's absolutely fantastic. Awesome. Um, yeah, I have one more question that says, uh, Debbie asks, Carla, what dirt do you have on me? Um, it's uh, not sure you want to go there or just claim forgiveness. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we did agree which things we, we don't mention, but maybe right. we can... Um, well, I, I'm okay. Maybe I can say that Thomas was a, a, a very good um, partying. He was always the last one to leave a party. Um, I think that's fair to say. And he, he was at, we, we both just, we love the party and uh, we have, a, we, we had many of those. And yeah, sometimes. Um, yeah, I think that's fair to say. Is that, can I say that, Thomas? Well, I said it already. I, I was also a reliable party guest who would just stick around, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, and then, oh, the other thing I can say about Thomas, that's actually, that, 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 that puts in a very positive light, though. Thomas stayed at university, like, honestly, he stayed very late at night to study he was his was the last we had our little desks and well it was i think it was also probably because you didn't you didn't come in very early in the morning that's fair to say you well, kind of rocked up sometime to, yeah. in the afternoon but <laughs> your light and the light on your desk was always on in the evenings and in the nights and uh yeah so that's that's some um, yeah that's mm -hmm. once you were in you could stay as long as yeah. you wanted you if you went out you could not get back in but yes uh that little yeah. desk at the library would be sometimes visited by the security guard at night um when i was still there um at least during that time i wrote my thesis and uh, had some people review it and um yeah that's fun times fun times <laughs> all right um yeah, one one uh, connection you didn't mention this morning, uh, you did it in your little blurb when you invited your folks uh, to join us this morning, is that we do actually have a um, a connection between your congregation uh, and in ours that our organists know each other. 
which makes for a really, really small world. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, right, right. So uh, your organist, uh, Peter Yarley Jones, did I say that right? Yeah. I, I stalked him uh, and he, I found out that in May 2015, he had on an American tour a concert here in Lincoln, Nebraska at um, First United Methodist Church. Uh, and uh, our Brent Shaw was organist at First United Meth Methodist Church and organized those concerts here. So um, super small world. Um, yeah, and, yeah. and we were just kind of excited to to find that connection. Yeah, so I, th I think it's just a big shout out to the organists. Um, it, it, I think it's one of the best things to have a talented organists in a church. Um, and I, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm so, so glad that we have our great Peter Yardley Jones. And I know the whole congregation is, and um, I think this, the same is probably for, for you. Church musicians are just so amazing. They, they really like it. I think church services really um, like, yeah, that, that can make, that makes our church services, I think, very much the music. Shout out to our musicians. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree. And finally, last but not least, um, you are doing a podcast called More Tea Vicar. And... Uh, a podcast for London lovers, Anglophiles, and critical believers is your tagline. Um, and it is, I want to say the majority is in English. The newer episodes have an intro and outro in Swiss German. Um, but I I just want to give a shout out to that. And I'm also going to put a link in the show note later here mm -hmm. on Facebook and YouTube so people can find it and want to hear you talk with some of your guests. Yeah, but and you will be one of my next guests. Yeah, that's we what I heard. So. We're recording that <laughs> next week, so I'm sure you will share that as well. All right. Well, um, maybe, yeah. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, well, if yep. Thomas doesn't share it, you will find it on the Swiss Church London webpage. I think it will be at the end of January or beginning of, of February. So if he keeps quiet about it, just look it up on yeah. our webpage. All right, I'll be... Uh, I will be uh, probably sharing that myself and uh, say what to ignore what I say. Um, no, no, that, I think that's exciting. And I think you do a wonderful job to to give people a sense of um, of, of, of living in that, that giant uh, world uh, of London is a world in itself, seems uh, almost a country in itself or a country of countries. And, um, and then there are the royals there and um, there are all kinds of different people and um i really love it i love what you do there and um uh, look forward to to talk more yeah yeah me too me too let this do, let this do, be the beginning of something new this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship yeah <laughs> not the beginning um carla thank you so much for being on with us this morning and um Thank you uh, to the Swiss Church London for um, loaning you us this morning or joining in. Um, uh, and yeah, let's stay in touch and um, blessing to your continued ministry um, of the community of, of, of neutral Swiss in uh, independent UK. Uh, <laughs> um, it's good to know, um, it's good to have a friend in London and um, thank you so much again for your message this morning. Thank you for having me and us. And everyone, we see you all um, next week. And um, next week, I believe we'll have Maggie Stuckli um, um, as our guest. I said I, I said that wrong. No, um, Maggie is right. Um, and um, I need to find the blurb in the newsletter. Look up at the newsletter um, and I'm just not going to say anymore because I'm going to butcher it. Um, but uh, we continue to have our visits uh, to have guests every week for our after chat service. And um, I know also one of those will be our our voice in my ear. Uh, Vince Rule is going to be one of our guests uh, in February, uh, the owner of the Coffee Roaster um, and our AV person. So look forward to that. Um, until then, um, God be with you and see you all soon.